Hi, and welcome to my talk on not-so-continuum mechanics, the mathematical modelling of granular flows. My name is Johnny Tang, I'm doing a PhD at the University of Cambridge. What are granular flows? Um, some examples of granular flows that we see every day are snow avalanches, um, sand, sand in a playground, um, landslides, migrating sand dunes, and then everywhere in industrial processes, from chemicals and cement and also grains, grain storage in silos. Um, of these, the landslides and migrating sand dunes are particularly important because landslides kill several thousands of people a year, especially in developing countries like India, and they cause huge damage to local economies as well. So it's really important that we understand these. Migrating sand dunes as well, um, if you build an oil well in the middle of the desert, you need to make sure that it's not in the way of a migrating sand dune, otherwise you won't have an oil well anymore after a few years. From a, more, from a less economic and more scientific point of view, granular flows are really interesting to be studied because they exhibit all sorts of behaviours that classical fluids don't. So they're very non-linear um, and they undergo a, a load of instabilities that, um, that ordinary fluids don't. Um, they're non-local, which means that a grain could affect not the grains that are around it, because a grain might not be touching its neighbouring grain, but it could touch one grain which touches another and another, and have an effect on a grain that's quite far away. So that means sometimes a PDE, which talks about some local changes, might not be the most appropriate way to model these granular flows. Um, they also exhibit a. They also exist in this sort of weird space between being a solid, being a liquid, being a gas, and they can switch between these quite at will. So they exhibit phase transitions quite naturally. So that's that's. Those are some of the reasons why it's really important to understand granular flows and why it's really cool to. How do we study them? So the field of granular mechanics is actually mostly dominated by earth scientists and by engineers and physicists. There aren't that many mathematicians working in it. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that, like I said just now, PDs sometimes, we're, we quite like continuum models. Um, when we do fluid mechanics, when we do aerodynamics, we are used to using PDEs to model things. but sometimes that's just not going to get you very far when you work with granular materials. Um, so the main things that people have done are field work and observation, where you actually go out into the desert and measure things, which by definition is realistic, but it's not controllable, it's extremely expensive. You have to do a lot of work to do the digging. Once you start digging, you affect the environment around you. It's not a good, it's not the, it's not the best way of doing things. You can set up models of what you're trying to do in the lab, which we do. Um, again, you can only really model, you can only really measure certain things from a lab experiment. So that's why we go to discrete simulations, where you get a big computer, you tell it to go and simulate 300,000 particles, and it goes away and does that for a month. And then you can actually look at the structure of the flow inside. Um, it's a bit hard to calibrate, but the point is, you can. Um, so, as mathematicians, we might be tempted to sort of look down on experimentalism, but um, we have to remember that experiments and simulations, experiments are traditionally how any physics field has been motivated. Um, so. Newton didn't just come out with Newton's laws, they came from experimental data, they, um, the universal, uh, universality of freefall, for example, was an experimentally determined fact, not, a, not just something that comes out of mathematics. So let's look at some basic granular properties. Um, so here we've got a beaker of glass beads. Um, kind of like sand, but just a bit finer, a bit more uniform. And we pour it onto a, onto a tray, and it splashes and spreads out. And water does the same thing. When you have a jet of water hitting a surface, it splashes. It does this sort of hydraulic jump bits here. 
and then spreads out. Well then, obviously, the difference between the grains and the water is that um, the grains don't spread out forever or get drained. They, for they start to form a heap. Um, and the reason for this is that when the grains collide with each other, this is a really dissipative process, and so all the energy that comes from the pouring um, is immediately dissipated as they as they start to collide with each other a bit more, and um, and that is like that is like a sudden reduction in temperature. It's like if you if you freeze a liquid, then it turns into a solid. So here it's like the the heat of the the thermal motions, the random motions in the liquid state being being taken away, and you're left with a solid state. Um, you can see it a bit more dramatically in this picture, where you've got a current of glass beads. Um, they're about this current is about three millimeters deep, um, hitting a bump. Um, the bump gives it an extra kick. That kick is enough t for it to for the current to disassociate, to vaporize, essentially, turning into a gaseous state. And then down here we've got another barrier which isn't shown in the photo, but um, that barrier is blocking everything. And when things collide with it, it's a dissipative process. So this gaseous stuff cools down again and forms a solid region here. So to sum up, we've got we've got liquid-like and solid-like properties for granular materials, and of course the most basic property of a granular material is that it's granular, which means that um, which means that there is this particle diameter scale, D, which we need to worry about. So when we do fluid mechanics with water, for example, the size of a water molecule is about 200 picometers, or 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is extremely small, and there are very few human contexts where we actually need to worry about the size of an individual water molecule. Um, I mean, a bacterium, for example, an E. coli bacterium is 10 to the minus 6, so four ma orders of magnitude larger than a water molecule. For for a granular flow here, um, this is 3 millimetres, um, the particle diameter is about 0.4 millimetres, so it's, it's not that many particles across, nowhere near. Um, so this grain scale will... We'll, we, we do have to worry about it, but it turns out, actually, that continuum models, um, even, even if L is not much greater than D, it turns out that continuum models work quite well, um, especially in this liquid state. Not so well in the solid state, but pretty well in the liquid state. And I'll spend the middle section of this talk talking to you about one of these continuum models, or one of these sort of mathematical models. So firstly, how do we distinguish between solid and liquid? We define this number here, this inertial number. So it's a dimensionless number, and when you do physics, it's always a good idea to look for dimensionless numbers, um, numbers that don't have units, numbers which are just ratios of different quantities. And that's useful because it means it's completely scale invariant. It doesn't matter whether you're using um, glass beads or sand or grits or tennis balls, as long as you scale everything up by the same amount, you get the same physics. That's the idea. Um, so what this inertial number does, it compares two quantities. It compares, um, well, it's got this D here to make the dimensions work out, but it compares this shear rate, gamma dot. So that's, roughly speaking, that's velocity divided by depth. And it compares that against the pressure, P, uh, P over rho which roughly speaking is, um, the P is roughly speaking the depth of the current. Um, so it, essentially it tells you how fast this flow is. A higher value of I means that gamma dot is higher, so, um, so we have a faster flow. Um, and experimentally you can distinguish between the solid, liquid and gaseous regimes by looking at this inertia number. And it's in this intermediate rate, um, intermediate interval that the model that I'm going to talk about works quite well. So the model that we need needs to be able to the model that we use needs to be able to relate the flow of the system, and the so the flow, the rate of shear, the kinematics of the system to 
the stress, the force, the dynamics of the system. Um, the stress is composed of two parts. There's the pressure, which is the normal stress on the system, and then there's the shear stress, which is the tangential force on the on your surface. So P and tau, and we need to relate them to gamma dot. So this relationship is entirely empirical. You can't get it from first principles for any... You have to do experiments for each material. But um, a long time ago, a guy called Newton came along and did some experiments for water, air, and syrup, and things like that. Probably not air, actually, but water and syrup. And Newton found that um, tau, the shear stress, is proportional to the rate of shear, the velocity gradients, um, du by dy. And this coefficient of proportionality is called eta. And so a fluid that satisfies this relationship here is called a Newtonian fluid, this linear relationship between tor and gamma dots. Um, on the other hand, a guy called Coulomb found that um, rigid bodies, if you just have a solid block on a plane, then Coulomb found that the friction force is it has nothing to do with the rate of shear, which, of course, in a rigid body, that's zero. But Coulomb found that the shear stress is just proportional to the pressure with this coefficient of friction here, mu. Um, hopefully you've all met that from A-level mechanics. So where does the granular material sit? Because granular materials are somewhere between fluid and solid. So it turns out that um, tau equals mu i of p. So it's kind of like the Coulomb friction, except that this friction coefficient is a variable. Um, mu is some function, some horrible empirically determined function, which, but the important thing is that it increases with i, like this. So slow flow, so mu takes a range of values between mu1 and mu2. Slow flows, mu1, fast flows, mu2, increasing monotonically. And what that means is faster flows experience more drag, slower flows experience less drag, the flow will adjust itself until we get a balance, tan theta equals mu. And so you can, you, because because you've got a relation, um, tan theta equals mu, so, so you can invert that to get um, i, this inertia number, as a function of theta. And then you can use the formula for i uh, with a du by d gamma here du by dy here to retrieve a velocity profile for u. And this velocity profile called the Bagnall profile is matched really well in experiments, so that's quite cool. It's This model works surprisingly well even though we it's a continuum model which shouldn't really work, but it does. You can generalize it to three dimensions, to time-dependent flows, and you get something like the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, it doesn't work so well when you have boundary layers or solidification, but that boundary layers, I don't know. It's it's something I'm working on at the moment. Um, so here, for example, you've it, it can model a system like this where you have a uniform mixture of two flow of two um, two species of sand, and um, this this mu of i model, when, once you generalize it properly, it can predict this instability that forms. Um, with remarkable accuracy, so you, you do you sort of do a perturbation analysis of a uniform flow, and you find that there are certain wave numbers which are particularly unstable. Um, this is a well posed instability as well, so it's a physical thing and not a mathematical abstraction. Um, it can also support wave solutions, which are also experimentally observable. So I'll just finish by saying why it's important for us mathematicians to look at granular materials. Um, obviously, granular materials are important anyway, but um, I think there's a lot that mathematicians can contribute to this. So half of our group are mathematicians, but the other half are not. So what can mathematicians contribute to this? Um, well, we're quite good at breaking problems down into its relevant, its important parts, and we're quite good at being being careful not to overinterpret any any models and also not to get confused between things which might be subtly subtly different but on the face of it the same or because people have chosen bad names for them so they get confused um that's all i have to say um thank you very much